Okay, let's start. So welcome to our talk. Uh, we will talk about schizophrenic files. And uh, first, this is... <laughs> yeah. Hi, so my name is Gunn Vayu I'm a security researcher at Google and Dragon Sector at the CTF team. I'm, a, I'm the captain. Uh, as the slide says, I like hamburgers. And actually, all opinions expressed during what I expressed during this talk belong to me. And they are not the opinions of my barber, my lawyer, nor my employer. And uh, I'm a reverse engineer, and I'm the author of a website called Corkami, which is about reverse engineering and visual documentations. So first, to introduce what we mean with the schizophrenic files, it's like it's one file that doesn't generate an error. It's not about exploitation or crash here. It's working under two different tools but, or more, and each time giving a different output. So no errors, but something different. Uh, and uh, also very important, it's not like the file is just check comparing some internal version and then behaving differently. It's like made passively because of a discrepancy between the parsers, for example. So uh, the reason behind this, uh, yeah, for first, uh, uh, Ginfail and I have been uh, re uh, experimenting with uh, schizophrenic files independently in the past. And then uh, together we have gathered enough material for a whole talk on the subject. The ref main reason was fun, because usually such cases don't generate any kind of uh, security. Well, they could, but it's not like they would become a CV by themselves. So the first reason is fun, and then, of course, there are applications. So even if it sounds like fun, there could be several applications, like bypassing security in various ways. And one of the most uh, famous examples is the Android signing bug, master key bug. So first, I'll hand it to Ginfeld, which will talk about this topic. OK, so the first example, because we have quite a lot of examples here. Uh, first example is the zip file. Who is familiar with zip files? OK, everyone. So. Just kidding. This is actually an excerpt, uh, excerpt from my talk, which was uh, done in Polish language. I don't expect you guys, well, everyone knows Polish language, so let's do it in English. Um, so the first zip trick, which was actually the Android master key bug, uh, basically, in the archive, you can place a couple of files which have, which have the same name, like the exact same name. Of course, you cannot compress these files from the file system, but you can change the names in a hex editor or whatever, right? So. Uh, what uh, this person did, and you should read this uh, paper, it's actually pretty awesome, is uh, he created an archive which had two files named the same way, and it turned, turned out that the signing was checked on the one file, but actually uh, the second file was what was used later on, which means it bypassed the signing because the file used for signing was okay, but the second one was, second one was totally evil. So this is the most simple trick, I guess, like having a couple of same names in the archive. Now, the second trick with zip is actually a little more, uh, this will take some more slides. And well, as you know, the zip file begins with PK letters, right? Wrong. So actually, that's not true. Actually, nobody knows how to interpret a zip, but we'll get to it. So basically, you start somewhere at the end. At the end, there is something called um, the end of central directory, which is a small header which has a pointer to, well, more structures which are in the middle. Now, the problem here is that uh, actually we don't know how big this header at the end is. Therefore, we don't know where to look for it. Because it has at the end of this header, there's a comment. And the comment has variable size, which means that the header can be anywhere from like just at the end of the file with no comment at all, or it can be, well, um, 64K into to the beginning of the file uh, with a really long comment. Uh, so this is the first problem, and it's actually not defined in the zip standard where to start looking for this, because we can look for it in two different ways, right? We can look, start at the end, and then assume we have a comment of length zero, and we look for the header then, there. But, uh, and then we like iterate. Maybe there is a comment of length one, maybe of two, and we move to the beginning of a file looking for the header for the end of central directory. On the other hand, we can do it the other way. I mean, we can assume that there is a long comment, there is a 64 kilobytes of comment, and then decrease the size of comment by one and look there. So uh, these are two ways which lead to schizophrenia, but I'm going to get to it. Because now uh, I'm going to talk about something completely different, which isn't really different, because I'm going to talk about the another header which is in the zip file. So what you saw at the beginning here 
Uh, this is actually, this isn't the zip header, this is uh, usually what we see, see there is a local file header. It, it's actually a structure which, um, well, it describes one single file, one single file which is in the zip, and actually there are quite a lot of local file headers in the zip file. Um, now, uh, for, so actually each file in the zip has, has this. Um, now, there's also something called the central directory. It's uh, placed near the end of a zip file, and it also has an entry for each file which is compressed. Uh, these are kind of redundant, so if one is broken, you can always use the other, and there are quite a lot of problems with it. Um, however, getting back to the, um, to the point, uh, sorry, um, okay, so uh, getting back to the point of the end of central directory, if we find it, it actually has a pointer to the central directory. And in the central directory, there are a lot of files, uh, sorry, entries for the files, and there's also a pointer to the, well, to the local file header and the data, because the data is always near the local file header. So I guess the question arises, why do we need the central directory if we can just go through, through the local file headers, right? Uh, now, the problem is that actually the local file header doesn't have to be at the beginning of the file. That's what I said, that it's wrong to assume that PK letters are always at the beginning of a file, because at the beginning of a file you can have anything, and the local file header can start somewhere else, and this is still a valid zip file, because, well, the central directory will point the parser to wherever the structure is. Um, now, uh, you can, of course, try to, uh, at least I assumed you can put one in the other, like put one in the comment of the other. Uh, however, and uh, did try this, and it doesn't really work so well with parsers, so let's just skip it. Now, uh, we are looking for, um, well, we are looking for how to parse a zip file. Um, we can actually do it a couple of ways. I already mentioned two, like looking for Vendolf's central directory from the, assuming that the, there is a large comment and assuming that there is no comment at all. Another way that is done is we can assume that we just ignore it and go through local file headers and the data. Because we have the size of the data, we can always skip through it and get to the next file. And so on and so on, so this is stream parsing. Um, and well, most of zip files can be parsed in this way because they are proper zip files which don't put any garbage in between. Uh, also, there's something I would like to call aggressive stream parsing, which means maybe a parser can look for the signature in the file, and when it finds it, it can assume, well, this is, this is uh, some file in the zip, and I'm going to try to parse it, try to extract it. Uh, let's call this aggressive stream. Now, I created actually a thing called abstract zip, which merges all these ideas into one file. So we have one file which can be parsed in these four different ways using, well, the end, uh, um, end way, which is, let's maybe skip here. Uh, end first, which is uh, meaning that there is no comment at all. Then there is start first, which means there is a huge comment, and in the comment of this, actually there is this end first, look, uh, end of central directory header, um, and also like all the other headers. There is also another stream here, another uh, place in this file. This is actually not linked to neither this nor this. It means this is a separate file, which if you start parsing from the end like you should, you will never encounter. Uh, and there is also some syntax breaker, which is, uh, which is actually garbage in between. And after that, there is another local file header with data. Now, let's look what, how different programming languages react to this. This is Python, and Python does what it should do. Uh, it means it actually, w when I give it this, uh, so, sorry, this opens the abstract zip file and prints it, and it displays only the end first file, which is the proper way of parsing zip. Now, if we feed it to PHP, I mean, PHP is the obvious culprit, right? If we want something weird, then we'll let's go for PHP. And PHP says start first is in this archive. It's the same archive as before as Python saw, but it actually reports a different file. And this is fully a different file. Uh, now let's go for some more weirdness, meaning Java. Uh, so Java has something called zip input stream, and it does stream parsing. So opening the same abstract.zip archive, well, it um, it sees only the readme underscore stream file, which is totally different. Now, if we, um, if we go to binwalk, which binwalk is an aggressive forensics tool that is supposed to find many files in a hard drive image, it actually finds all the files, including, including the aggressive one, and lists them. So that's really good. Um, to sum up this, actually most of the application uh, and most of the libraries, default libraries in programming languages, 
open and first. They assume there is no comment at the end and start looking for the header from there. Um, I guess only PHP and uh, TCL goes, um, goes for the start first file. And uh, Java and Ruby goes for, for stream parsing, which is, th this is totally incorrect. I mean, this may pass, but this is totally incorrect. You shouldn't do it this way unless you are like parsing streams of zip, but zip isn't the correct format to do it. Uh, and I guess only forensics tools do, um, well, find this aggressive stream, which is, which is good. Now, um, I would like to thank these people, Moander, Felix, Salvation, and Yuru, for actually running all these applications and these tests for me, um, assuming that they are all uh, okay and don't, don't have any exploits in them. Thank you. Uh, but why do we care? So, well, it could be used to bypass some signing. I actually did during a um, uh, code review find a bug like this, where an, an archive was verified using end first method, but then it was extracted using stream uh, from the beginning of a file. So this happens. Uh, however, what I did, I started, I made four copies of this file and started putting the ACAR virus test inside each position. And well, most antiviruses only scan end first, which is, which is actually good because this means that, well, most applications open it this way, so that, that should be okay. However, there are some uh, applications, uh, sorry, some antivirus like software which try to open it and parse its stream only, which means it doesn't find, never finds the files which are opened by, um, well, by using most of the applications, which is, which is bad. For all tests, you can, you can, uh, you can see them here. I, it's a spreadsheet which has all the results. So I'll go on with the PDF uh, file format. If you're not familiar with the PDF file format, I did a one-on-one -on -one with videos and examples. Uh, here's the URL. And uh, just uh, as a reminder, so a PDF file is made of different objects that refer to each other via a structure, via a graph structure. So you see the trailer, the root, the pages, and so on. And basically here, the trailer is the one pointing to the root. And if you have an extra object that would be, wouldn't be used by the other, referenced by the other object, that would be fine. So you can add a, how do you say, a parasite object, which means that the, uh, when a PDF reader sees a document, it means it actually found the right trailer and the root, uh, the root object, and then everything can be can independently coexist in the same file. So basically, if we see the file trailer, it says the StartX ref line should be preceded by the trailer, uh, blah blah blah, and also importantly, there is a comment. So if it uh, if it starts with percentage, it's a comment, and should be ignored. So what happens if you have for example, this kind of trailer, so one trailer defining a root, but this one is actually commented. This one is, is normal, and this one actually doesn't have the trailer keyword. So what would happen if those two should be rejected? And actually, you can put all those three in the same file, and you get this. So that's the same file. So that's Chrome, and that's, uh, uh, well, you see, uh, it is this trailer. That's Adobe Reader, and then that's Sumatra. And this is all the same file, and it's not about just a different picture. It's three complete different documents. So you, can, you could say that on the other way, this is a fake document, and this is an exploiting document for Adobe. And then if someone opens it and doesn't see the right document, they would just ignore the other objects, unless they have some forensic, ab so forensic ability. Another problem, uh, so this was clearly a problem with the non-respecting the specs. But sometimes it's in the specs, but the specs are too obscure, and PDF is a very good candidate. So it's like there are so many things in the PDF file format that actually I didn't know about it until recently. And I expect most of you don't know about it. So do anyone see anything special with this file? So first, who is usually using Adobe Reader at some point? Yeah, for just for schizophrenic testing, of course. So here, what's unusual is that there is this little icon. It's not really a problem in itself. It just means that the file has layer. And this is a feature. And now, do you see what's wrong? So basically, what you see on the screen is not what you're going to print. And this is transparent. When you do that, this is a feature. So you, because this file has layer, and the layer are playing with the printability and view, viewability, then you don't have a warning because it's, it's a feature. So now, 
we can see that's so it's called optional content configuration and you can see I define two layers I call them visible and printable but usually a documented a professional printing document has like 15 layers or this kind of thing and then you just define default state export printable used viewable for each of the layers so it's even a part of the feature so there's no warning and you could argue that you see it in the preview then I would say either just leave the page one unchanged or uh, just do a minor change and uh, put your difference at the fewer the next pages or just do a minor change that the people are unlikely to spot in the difference of the file so in this case it's not even uh, um, yeah it's in the specs there's not even a magic trick or a misinterpretation sadly it's not so good for POC GTFO because it's Adobe only and what then displays with other readers that don't handle this feature will vary with various readers. But then you could use the previous schizophrenic type, like with the trailers, so that your trick is only activated under Adobe. So you could, uh, if someone is using another reader, they have a normal document, and if they use Adobe, then they have a, uh, how do you say, a document with a printing trap and no warning. So, this is very rarely used for a bad purpose, and of course, this can be abused for obvious reasons. Okay, um, now let's uh, get to some tricks which I don't think they have some security implications, but they are still funny. So uh, this is a cute little trick I published years ago uh, in Hacking Magazine when it was still <laughs> decent enough to publish in. <laughs> Yes, so basically the BMP is a really simple format, right? Uh, well, more or less. Anyway, you have a file header, you have an, another header here, and then you jump into pixel da data. Now, there's this BF offset bits field here, which basically points to the beginning of the data. Now, as you might suspect, uh, some applications ignore it, and some applications expect the data to be after the headers which means that you can put some pixel data here with one bitmap, and uh, you can put a proper, pix, uh, pop, sorry, proper bitmap here and point to it in the header, and some applications might display, well, proper image, and the other might just go for, for, for ignoring this field. So uh, this is one file, two different bitmaps again, and um, this is how it looks. Uh, thankfully, most of the applications actually respect that, or, uh, sorry, respect that field. Another trick, which is something that actually spoiled one of my CTF tasks but, uh, that I created, but thankfully in the testing, is related to compression in BMP. So actually BMP can be compressed. It's uh, compressed by run length encoding, which is kind of quite, quite interesting, actually. So it has uh, what you would expect from long, run length encoding, meaning uh, these are the opcodes. One opcode is like you just put the length of, like for example, 12, and then you put, uh, sorry, you put the color. And this means that the next 12 pixels will be this color. Um, now, you should actually assume that this is some kind of a script rendering the bitmap, and this is not, uh, not pixel data, which is there. Now, the second opcode, when length is set to zero, this is actually an escape opcode. And uh, the next value is more than two. Uh, it's called uh, raw length, which means that you are supposed, or actually the decoder is supposed to as expect um, this many pixels, not non-compressed afterwards, and just copy them to, um, to the bitmap, to the output bitmap. Now, actually, it, uh, BMP kind of ex extended this R, sorry, RLE. It added three more opcodes. One is, is just end of line, which means where, wherever the cursor is on rendering the output bitmap, just jump to the end of a line. And there is also the same for end of bitmap, and there is something to just move the cursor by x, y um, bytes to a different, uh, sorry, sorry, pixels to a different position. Now, the, the question is, I guess, uh, what happens, what data will be in the output bitmap if you just jump over some areas of space? Will it be background? Will it be, I don't know? Well, let's check. Actually, there are three options here. The first one is, uh, well, the blank spaces are actually filled with the background color. Here, the background color is uh, zero, which is white. Uh, zero as in the zero index in the palette, of course. And uh, this is how properly, I think, I, I expect BMPs should be displayed. If we 
go for a different viewer, however, it doesn't display it at all, but it displays a different, um, different part of a bitmap uh, because it assumes that the missing pixels are all black and it fills the missing spaces with black. So you can already see what I did with this bitmap. I actually rendered, well, told it to render some background color pixels in these areas and just jump between them. Um, so again, this is, there is nothing hidden here. This is, uh, well, something is actually hidden there, depending on what viewer you, you are using. And if you use genome and uh, I think I of genome, uh, the default viewer on, under, uh, well, genome, uh, you can actually see everything because it assumes that background is just transparent, which is quite weird for BMPs uh, because we are not used, I guess, to BMPs having transparency. Um, but there it is. So basically the same bitmap, but three different things you can see. And I'm sure. So uh, let's go on with the image and now the PNG file format. So, a uh, nice uh, trick highlighted with a very cute poc from Dominic from River City. So, basically, you have the same image data that is combining two images, and each image is actually using only a part of the colors, but then there are two, pal two palettes, actually, even though it's a breach over the official specification. So, if you use two palette uh, data in the file, what happens? Uh, first, it, technically speaking, it should reject the file or it at least, will it take the first one or the second one? And so that's a very cute POC, because you see that in one case, so that's the same pictures using the same, no, two pictures using the same image data, each of them using 16 colors of the whole palette, and you see that one palette is using the higher nibble, the high, the high nibble of the, the, the palette itself, and the other palette of this image is using the lower, the, the lower nibble. So you see it's a way to encode uh, easily two palettes in one, and then one file viewer takes the first palette chunk, and the, another viewer takes the second one. So there should, on be, there should be only one palette chunk, but in standard, they take the first one and ignore the next ones from now on. But still, in any case, it's against the specs, and uh, this, this one is the one with the unusual behavior. Most of them just take the first chunk, uh, palette chunk. Uh, well, uh, now let's move on to some executable files. I do some stuff about the PE files, and uh, I won't go into details, because typically the PE files loader, the executables of win uh, file format of window, uh, is, um, is pretty uh, backward compatible, and whenever there was a change over the version, they actually just kill some weird bugs or something. So typically, most of the time when there's evolution, it actually kill something nasty from the past. There are very few differences among the, uh, the things that change among the version of Windows. So here you have XP, Vista, uh, Vista 7, and Windows 8. And only in the relocation types, there were some variation. So for, due to a bug, type 4, high, uh, map to high edge, was actually doing nothing in the case of uh, XP and uh, Vista 7. And that was fixed in the Windows 8. Now there is the obscure um, Type 9 that, is more, that was used for Itanium that is doing different results under XP and 7, but now is not supported anymore because they dropped Itanium from Windows 8. Whoa. So actually, now what can we do? So it's very easy to do a difference between those two versions or those two versions, but, well, I wanted to do a uh, schizophrenia that would work independently on the, uh, that would work correctly on the three versions, but with a different behavior. So the trick is that you can apply a relocation on other relocations further in the list. So basically, I will use this one to actually patch that one of type 9 into a type 10, and type 10 is hopefully, uh, luckily, supported by all the versions, so in this case, it won't do anything because it's still here because it's not patched. And in the case of Windows 8, my type 9 has been changed into a type 10. I, I showed that in the POC GTFO uh, issue 2, I think. Uh, that's the magazine of Travis Goodspeed, if you're not aware of it. And uh, so basically, the workflow is that I, my first relocation is processed. Then under XP and uh, Vista 7, it won't do anything. And under uh, um, Windows 8, it will actually patch relocation 2. Then relocation 2 is, in any case, because it's just the next one on the file, is processed. And now under Windows 8, it's a type 10. 
And then under XP and 7, it's still a type 9, then it creates different results. So now we have a schizophrenia that works in all cases, no error, no bugs, but actually has a different loading uh, behavior, is diff loaded differently uh, under different versions of Windows. Uh, if, you are fam if you are interested in uh, elf uh, eccentricities, I, ha I deeply recommend this talk by Julian Bangert and Sager Bratus. As you see, plenty of fun with uh, this time the elf. Okay. Uh, well, we already had the BMP, we had PNG, time for GIF. Uh, okay, this is. I was also writing some article about GIF years ago, and uh, I stumbled upon this behavior but never made a POC in, as a schizophrenic POC. Yesterday we talked with Anja and actually came up with this. So um, you may not, have, well, you are, I guess all of you are familiar with animated GIFs, right? But animation was added later in the standard. At the beginning there was the idea of having multiple logical images, or sorry, uh, one logical image and multiple physical images. Uh, and you define each physical image separately, and you would also tell, well, it would have its size, and you would tell, hey, render this, add this coordinates on the logical image. So if you define three distinct um, images, uh, then it would, well, render the, it into this. Now, it's, um, if you defined another chunk, but, uh, the chunk which was added later, and which was the speed of animation, uh, it would actually interpret these images not as uh, physical images in one logical image, but as frames of animation. Now, if there is, again, uh, let me put it a different way. If there is no free, uh, sorry, frame speed defined, that means that this is just an old school GIF with one image. Now, uh, certain parsers, especially browsers, but not only, tend to animate everything. I mean, if they don't have defined the frame speed, they just assume as frame speed, some default frame speed, which means that the image uh, before wouldn't look like this, but it would actually be animated. The first frame is always treated at, as background, and it's always here, as you can see, but the rest of the frames just like switch. Uh, now, this actually gives us, uh, well, a way to do create a schizophrenic POC, uh, which means we define the first frame, which is the background frame, again with one image, and then we do quite a lot of frames with like just this pixel, basically rendering in exact this spot. Um, and at the end, we define another whole image. Uh, I would like to, um, well, say that every image has its own palette or can have its own palette, so these are like 256 colors. Um, and, uh, well, so if this is interpreted as an animation, what would happen is that you would see this, and, well, you wouldn't notice this because it's the same color as this, and it would take quite a lot of long time to actually switch into this image. However, if um, the parser actually interprets this GIF correctly, it will not try to animate it, and it will just jump to this image, and it will show this image. So, for example, Paint and, uh, well, this is Total Commander's viewer actually do show it in correct way, uh, according to me. However, all the browsers I tested try to animate it, and also Irfan view try to, try to animate it. Um, Jimp, however, was quite, um, handled it quite well, because it created a lot of layers, it called them, their, sorry, them frames, but these are actually layers where the background image was the first image, and the last frame was actually the last frame, so you could use it to see both images. Um, okay. So now we have uh, we presented about uh, schizophrenia between different tools. So basically, two tools behaving differently with the same file. But sometimes it happens that it's even worse that actually within the same tool you have two parts of the tool that behave differently, and then it's really difficult. Uh, so actually, the first one was WinRAR. When you open a, an archive with WinRAR, a zip with WinRAR, the behavior to view the content of the file is not the same as when it, you actually ask to extract. And that was a problem for me when I was playing with polyglots because uh, I, had, I could open the file but not I couldn't extract. So in one case it was failing, but in the worst case it was doing nothing. It was starting to do something, then it was not crashing but not saying anything. So feel free to experiment about that. And also, uh, re uh, what we saw earlier, the problem with Adobe, that uh, viewing, uh, viewing, the difference between viewing and printing, uh, if you think about your next letter to HR, it could have a nice consequence, right? Uh, 
So um, also on the way to the perfect schizophrenia, we had a couple of uh, experimentations, failures, or maybe uh, in, just in progress, and we need maybe your input for that. So uh, yeah, uh, we, we initially wanted to have a um, kind of uh, perfect schizophrenia via, uh, on images via color profiles. So color profiles are those uh, complex data that you embed with the file so that the file is displayed, is printed correctly and uh, or uh, rendered correctly on your screen and so on. That's quite complex to be honest. And basically you have here different standards of color profiles and you see they map some colors differently. And what happens if you would use some colors uh, that only works with one profile and not the other. The problem here is that um, the, how do you say, the not so many uh, easily accessible tool actually handle those. It's really complex, so you know that Photoshop do, uh, can handle that and so on, but uh, well, for experimenting, just for the sake of experimenting, it's not so nice. And especially creating those files, there are no really libraries that actually manipulate those files. The, those not files, but these uh, the profiles to be embedded with the file. So usually they just open a picture, but they are not, they don't care about color profiles at all. So basically it's difficult to experiment with that. Uh, another thing I experiment when playing with JPEG for another uh, topic was that I saw that Airfan View, even though it's commonly used, is supporting a lot more uh, irregular chunk types than all the others. So basically, you, you, you use a buggy, uh, un, un, unofficial chunk type. Airfan View is happy. All the other uh, file viewer, uh, viewers are, un, are unhappy. But I couldn't get the others to work, so then it didn't work. And also a bit like BMP, which has an offset to the next data. Uh, I tried with FLV. Uh, so flash video is not so complex in the format. Even typically, we think that videos are huge, but they can be made pretty small. And uh, I tried to, to get some discrepancy very similar to the first BMP trick, but it didn't work. Although at some point, I had VLC saying, I cannot load this video, but still it was playing some random sound. So maybe there is some possible thing to be found at this topic. I also, yeah, just for, if you remember this guy who said he had right uh, access on YouTube by uploading a video, I'd created a PDF uh, FLV uh, polyglot and I uploaded it to YouTube, but uh, YouTube refused after it uploaded it. I mean, I still have it on my list, let's say, uh, your file is incorrect. Next try, maybe. But I have right, uh, writing rights on YouTube. So PNG, uh, PNG has many stuff like um, so an ancillary chunks uh, that will affect the rendering levels, like color profiles, uh, gamma and uh, transparency. So for palettes, specifying, speci specifying how, uh, if a color will be transparent with palleted images, it's often supported. Some stuff that could help me for the color profile parts, like significant bits and chromacities, it's never supported. And I was a bit disappointed that something I think useless, like a physical size, which means you define a pixel ratio. So instead of having square pixels, if you want to squish your, your, your image, then you say, this, my pixel are actually two pixel wide and one pixel. It's not really DPI. I think it's pretty useless, but I was, I was a bit disappointed to see it's actually supported anywhere, but I couldn't uh, abuse that. So maybe failures currently, but maybe with some input or suggestions, I will actually make something out of that, or again fail, of course. So uh, conclusion, um, if you think about it, all most of these file formats, the specs are public, the, some parsers is often public, and yet the result is very messy. So this, uh, Sometimes the specs are okay, but in the case, for example, of zip, even now the specs are still very messy, and even worse, the parsers don't even respect them. Then, it, while it all makes the, I would say, our um, security of, at the computer, at the software level, uh, less strong, then there, when there, whenever there is such a bug, you cannot claim a CV for that. You cannot blame on the full disclosure or anything uh, for badly parsing a picture. So basically, until there is a crash on an exploit or something major like the Android master key bug, then there's nothing we can do to, to shame, highlight, report, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, our POCs and slides are available at this address. Uh, I'd like to thank all these people for their contribution. And so, so does Gin fail, so he's a... Uh, and uh, thank you for your attentions. 
Any questions? Oh, yes, there is. In case. Thanks as well. So we do have time for questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand so I can raise to you with the mic. Any questions? Just listen to the voices in your head. He's not that scary. Just one question over there. Just a note. If you're looking on the slides, we have a bonus round. So you can go for it. Yeah, uh, we all know from the security point of view that uh, the TIFF format is a huge mess. TIFF, like, uh, in, like in overflows in libtiff. The, the fax for image? Yeah, the true image file format. Yeah, yeah. And have you found something funny to do with this image that are actually multi-page documents and that are really messy? So I didn't look through the them. TIFF, the TIFF yeah. file Did you format. go through it? Uh, I, I, I did some experience with TIFF, but not really for schizophrenia, so not really. I didn't really try, but yeah. thanks for the suggestion. So on a similar note, we didn't go through like HTML interpretation or CSS interpretation, because why kick the, like, somebody who's already lying on the ground, right? More questions over there? Hi. Um, <clears throat> how many files were you able to put into one file so that all of them were still uh, correct? I think you... So as polyglot, you mean? Or something? So, so do you mean, many? as in schizophrenia, I think the zip one was had the four, four different interpretations, if that's what your question is about. I don't believe we did one which had more interpretation, but being said, I, I guess like, so I did mention in the zip part that you can look for the end of central directory header from assuming that there is no comment and assuming that there is a huge comment, right? But actually what you can do, you can also start looking in the middle. And maybe if you'd like place quite a lot of end of central directories header at different possible locations, maybe something tries to uh, jump in the middle and, and you'd be able to like trick another tool. If that was your question. One more question. Yeah, hi. Um, thank you for your speak. I was wondering with the SIP issue, um, how do the common implementation of Windows or Mac OS deal with not so nice formatted SIP files, like the Explorer or the Finder SIP functionality? So uh, actually, they were really boring, boring, as in they didn't do anything uh, out of what you would expect them to do, which was yeah, which was surprising, and I was unhappy about it, but actually, like, I, I think there's a file manager called Unreal Commander on Windows. If you want to test schizophrenia or, like, weirdness in parsers, that is the perfect choice because they are, like, vulnerable to everything. Any more questions? One more here. Yeah, on the uh, zip file passing, have you looked at AV engines and if how they process it? Or like when you try and send zip files through Gmail, for instance, have you looked at how they handle it? You, uh, I, didn't, I didn't understand, sorry. Could you repeat? <laughs> uh, sure, uh, with the zip file processing, have you looked at how AV engines might look at a, a zip file? Or for instance, Gmail won't let you attach zips, or it'll un unzip in a zip file, for instance. Oh, I, oh okay. So. Uh, with uh, with Gmail and unzipping zips, if that is your question, uh, I hope it's all correct because I actually did a security review for that. So, uh, that being said, I dis did test because, as you know, Gmail scans also files for viruses, and I did an ACAR test with it, and it was actually behaving really well. As in, I think it found all the instant instances. So, yeah, that was okay. No more questions. If not, then it's the official break till half past four. There's actually muffins um, upstairs and obviously water and club mate. So enjoy the break. Thank you.